Are you going to cry out to God and say, God, what are you trying to do in my life? Or are you just going to gripe about it? And that it wasn't your fault that you're in the pit. And it might not have been your fault. I'm, I'm, I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying, you, why not ask God what the purpose is, what he's trying to do in your life? All right, so we're going to continue our series, uh, Dream to Destiny. And I want to remind you that every person has a dream from God. Remember, Joseph's dreams were from God. And every person has a destiny from God. God has something that only you can do. Robert Morris can't fulfill your destiny. Uh, you, only you can do it. But many, many people live with the dream instead of in the destiny. And you know what I mean by that. In other words, they'll say, I have this dream. I have a dream. I have a dream. I will do something for God. I have a dream. But God wants you to step into the destiny and fulfill the destiny. And we're, we're, some of these tests were after Joseph actually stepped into his destiny. He was still taking tests. These tests last the rest of your life. And the reason is, is because God is building our character to support the destiny. Uh, you're, 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 you will never do more, or, or uh, I, it's not that we do it, God does it through us. So, but let me just say this, your destiny will never be larger than your character will support. And the reason for that is even, destiny is greater responsibility in the kingdom and God knows that that responsibility would become a burden, not a blessing or a weight that you couldn't carry. And so he won't allow you to step into something you can't bear, in essence, for your own good. So we're talking about that. Last week, we talked about the pride test. This week is passing the pit test, all right? So Genesis 37, I'll pause and make a few comments as we read this story. Verse 13. And Israel, now remember that's Jacob, jo Joseph's father. His name was Jacob. God changed it to Israel. So the Bible will use them interchangeably. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. And then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, that's where they were, and he went to Shechem. I want you to be, start looking when you read the Bible for things to jump off the page at you, all right? Because this jumps off, and there's a lot in the Bible that's actually funny that I think we miss. It says, now a certain man found him, found Joseph, and there he was wandering in the field. Okay, it, it doesn't say that he went up to the man and asked him, where his brothers were, he was just wandering in the field. Now, remember, he was a dreamer. I think he was a daydreamer also. He's just wandering around, and a man comes up and finds him and says, uh, and then he says to him, and the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? So he said, I, I kind of think he, he, he might have even thought, oh, thanks for reminding me, <laughs> um, I'm seeking my brothers. Oh, that's what I'm here to do. I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they've departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. That's in Alabama. <laughs> okay. All right, it's just a joke. All right. Now, I underlined this so we could, but we'll come back to it later, right? Now, when they saw him afar off, in other words, a long way away, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. And then we have kind of a synopsis of their conversation. But what I want to show you is they had a, a, they had a conversation. They saw him so far off that they had time to have this conversation, okay? Um, and then they said to one another, look, the dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. We're talking about the pit test. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. Notice they said, this is what we're going to say. We're going to say a wild beast has devoured him. Later, we're going to find out about this, that statement about whether they said it or not, actually. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, Reuben's the firstborn, heard it 
and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him. And these little hyphens here are, uh, the reason he said that is that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, I'm just showing you it took a long time from when they saw him for him to get there. It came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic or his robe, his coat, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Remember, many colors. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Okay, so we're going to talk about the pit and getting out of the pit, all right? So here's, here's the first thing, the position of the pit. The position of the pit. Now, what I mean is, what got me in this position? Whatever pit you might be in, it could be a financial pit, a family pit, a marriage pit, a relational pit, a spiritual pit. You know, it says there was no water. You could feel like you're in a dry place. But what got you in that position? And I'm not talking about uh, looking down on yourself or condemning yourself. I'm talking about like the way David did, search me, O God, and try my heart. Test me, know my thoughts. See if there's a wicked way to me. In other words, God, did I do anything to cause this situation in my life that you want to help me uh, and learn in that area and grow in that? I, I, I don't think we do that many times. I think we do what Joseph might have done at the first and just simply blamed his brothers. In other words, it's not my fault I'm in the pit. I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. It's always somebody else that's doing things to me. Uh, that's the reason I'm in this pit. It's not pride in me, it's envy in them. And that's the way he could have thought. But when we think that way, we're going down the wrong road. It, it is very prevalent in our society today uh, to blame where we are now on someone else. And this wasn't very pre prevalent years ago. What happens though now is we, we go to a counselor or something and they tell us, you know, that shouldn't have happened and pretty soon we blame the way we are on our parents. And we say, well, it's, it's their fault. But here's the problem with that. We lock ourselves into that then. And you need to remember, you've been adopted by a new father who does love you and who does tell you that he loves you and shows his love to you. So I'm just saying, don't lock that, don't let that happen. And I think Joseph might have done that. By the way, um, why was, wasn't Joseph with his brothers anyway? I don't know if you ever thought about that, but many theologians have thought about that, and I've read a lot about this. Um, and some of you might say, well, he was only 17. David was taking care of sheep when he was 17. That's the same age. So why wasn't he with his brothers? Well, many theologians believe it's because there was such animosity that the father had to separate them. And here's the other reason. Why did he send his brother to Joseph to check on his older brothers. Uh, let, uh, let's think for a minute, because there's one brother younger. There are 12, remember? Benjamin's younger. So there are 10 older brothers, okay? Eight of them were in their 20s and 30s. Reuben and Simeon, the two oldest, were in their 40s. And he sent a 17-year-old to check on them and on the sheep. Listen, they knew how to take care of sheep. He was not sending Joseph to them to check on them or the sheep, he was trying to develop a relationship with them. See, Joseph brought some of these tests on himself, but we're gonna see as we keep going that some of the tests he didn't bring on himself and he passed with flying colors. But I don't think he passed this one with flying colors. It says, uh, um, Verse 18, when they saw him afar off, remember that? I read that and I said, we're gonna come to that? Even before he came near, they conspired against him, conspired. They had a long conversation about this, okay. Have you ever thought about how they saw him so far off? Simple, he was wearing that blasted coat. <laughs> he wore that thing everywhere. 
he, he would have worn it in Texas in August. <laughs> they, I mean, this coat of many colors that you could see for a mile away. You know, orange, purple, pink, blue, green, yellow, red. I don't know, but many colors is what it says. That's how they saw him afar off. Okay, here, when you read the Bible, look for analogies. Here's an analogy. He was his, uh, his father's favored son. I don't know if you know this, but you are your father's favored son or daughter, all of you. Favor means grace. God's grace is on you. He's put his favor on you. He favors you. Um, his father gave him a gift. I don't know if you know this, but your father has given you a gift. Here's the problem. He was proud of his gift. And he showed it off every chance he got. And a lot of people are proud of their gifts. And they show them off. And your gifts aren't for showing off, they're for helping people. Uh, I, I've had people say to me uh, before, I don't, they just slip it into their conversation, you know, their gift. And, uh, and this is just one that just kind of stands out to me. Uh, you know, I've had several, many, many people say to me, Pastor, I just wanted you to know I'm a prophet. And I feel like saying, so am I. So I actually already knew you were a prophet. <laughs> I, I, I just think, why do you have to tell me you're a prophet? Prophets encourage people. Why don't you just encourage me? Why don't you just use your gift instead of having to show it off? And that's exactly what I think he had to do. Now, I want to point out something here. Because he was proud of his gift and he showed it off all the time, he actually lost his gift. Now, some of you might think, now, hold on, Pastor Robert. I remember a scripture. don't remember where it is. It's Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, by the way, <laughs> that says the gifts and callings of God are irreversible or irrevocable without repentance, old King James. So say irrevocable. Let's use that version. Okay. Okay. I didn't say the father took it away from him. I said he lost it. Uh, and by the way, if you're going to use Romans eleven twenty nine 29 for that, number one, that's not even talking about your gift. That's talking about the Jewish people. Just read Romans 11 and see it's talking about the Jewish people. But secondly, how do we know God didn't restore it to him? First of all, I think in a couple of ways. He became the second wealthiest man in the world. I think he eventually had hundreds of coats. I think he had a closet personally that had one of those buttons that you just push the button, you know, and the coach just went by. But I actually think he got this coat back because it never tells us what happened to it, but I don't think his father ever threw it away, personally. That's just my, I, now I don't know, but it's possible that he actually got that coat back with the animal's blood on it, and he would look at it and think, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for that pit you delivered me out of and what you've done in my life. It's possible. But I'll tell you what he did get back that's more important than the gift. He got relationship with his father back as he began to pass these character tests. So the first is the position of the pit. Here's the second is the perspective of the pit. Uh, and what I mean by that is Let's get God's perspective of the pit that you're in. Whatever pit you're in, let's get God's perspective. Now, the first one that will show up to tell you uh, why you're in the pit and give you perspective is the enemy, the accuser of the brethren. He's there. Um, when I, uh, the way to tell, by the way, what voice you're hearing, whether it's God's or the, or the enemy's, people, this is one of the most frequently asked questions I get asked. How do you tell? It's very simple. If it's condemning, it's Satan. If it's convicting, it's the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, well, what's the difference? Condemnation is general. Conviction is specific. God will say to you, you were, let me, I'm just trying to think of an illustration. This first one came to mind. I don't have this like in my notes, but God might say to you, uh, you were um, wrong 
when you spoke that way to your wife. And I want you to go ask her forgiveness. He's very specific. Satan will say, you're a bad person. You're, you're mean. You're, you're evil. The reason you're in this pit is because you're just a bad person. You know, uh, Satan is a pit professional. I mean, he, he, he hangs out in pits to tell everybody that. You need to know when I said if it's condemning, it's always the enemy. God will never condemn you. Never. Uh, and I, I wish everyone would re- memorize the scripture I'm about to give you. It's right after the most memorized scripture in the Bible, which is John 3, 16, and, and not taking anything away from verse 16. Here's verse 17, though. For God did not, did not, did not, did not. I'd like to say that about 50 more times until we get it. Did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But through him, the world might be saved. And then the next verse, which I want to read to you, says the reason he didn't send his son into the world to condemn us is because we were already condemned. We were born condemned. So some will say, well, well, well why did this happen? And we, I have such a, a burden for us to understand, have a biblical worldview. I'm actually thinking about preaching a series on a biblical worldview because we've lost it. If you don't view the world through the Bible, if you view it through humanism, or if you view it through uh, any other worldview that's out there, it, it'll mess up everything you go through and you won't be able to understand it. Now, look, look at verse 31. It said, so they took, I wanna show you how good Satan is at giving you perspective that's wrong. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, now watch this. They didn't tell him an animal whipped him up. They they said before they were going to say that, but they didn't say that. They said, we have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, it is my son's tunic. Watch this. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn into pieces. They didn't tell him that. He just saw that and came to that conclusion. Okay, I hope you never forget what I'm about to tell you. Satan is so good that he will fabricate evidence to get you to believe a lie. He, will, he wants you to jump to the wrong conclusion. And that's what they did. Think about that. Think about these brothers. Here, here's, here's what they did. They, they said, we found this. Is this your son's coat? As if they didn't know. And then, by the way, do you know how long it was that before Jacob found out he was alive? 22 years. He found out he was alive when Joseph was 39. This is when he's 17. 22 years years. And, and it makes me a little mad at the brothers because I'm thinking 22 years, if you heard your father crying himself to sleep and you never walked across the hall to tell him, dad, he's alive. We, we, he, uh, it wasn't a wild beast. That's not what happened. 22 years, he believed a lie. Please, please hear me. Satan will fabricate evidence. I, I've been doing this a long time. I've seen it a lot. All right, here's point number three, the purpose of the pit. I mean, what's the purpose of the pit? God did allow this. What's the purpose of the pit? Well, one reason was to save his life because they were going to kill him. So even though he was sold into slavery, that was a lot better than dying because God even delivered him from that. Okay, but here's the purpose of every pit. It's to cry out to God. It, look at Jonah chapter two. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord. Why? Because of my affliction, because of the situation I got myself into. Because God told me to go that way and I went that way. Because of my affliction, I cried out to the Lord. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried and you heard my voice. Sheol is an Old Testament word for the pit. Many times it's actually translated the pit. And just to prove it to you again, verse six says, you have brought up my life from the pit. See, the, the, the question is, are you going to cry out to God or are you just going to gripe? 
when you're in a pit? Are you going to cry out to God and say, God, what are you trying to do in my life? Or are you just going to gripe about it? Or are you just going to gripe about who threw you in the pit and that it wasn't your fault that you're in the pit? And it might not have been your fault. I'm, I'm, I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying, you, why not ask God what the purpose is, what he's trying to do in your life? I actually think that Joseph started out the wrong way. I think this is actually the turning point of his, of, of his life because I can watch the other tests how he, he just passes with flying colors after this. But I think he started out saying, now God, I just want to remind you of the dream you gave me. The, the, the dream is that they're going to bow down to me one day. They're going to be sorry for this. Yeah, because, and, and I know God, I know God, you're going to get them. Now, I don't want you to get them, God, but I just know you, God. I know you're going to get them for what they did to me because they were wrong. They were wrong, God, and you know they were wrong. And, but one day they'll bow down to me, God, and it's probably where he started. Then after a few minutes of God not talking to him, you know, he probably started saying, well, now, Lord, I do want to admit that I, I might have had a little something to do with this, but mainly it's their fault. Just want to remind you, it's their fault and you're going to get them. Don't forget you're going to get them. But I just, I, I might have had a little something to do with it. After a few hours, I thought he was, I think he was like, oh God, it's my fault. I know it's my fault, God. And he repented. And I think the moment he did is when Judah said, hey, let's pull him up out of the pit and sell him instead of kill him. Judah got that idea. There are a lot of things in the Bible that we need to understand uh, that are analogies, similes. Um, let, me, let me show you one. It says Reuben, who was the firstborn, says, I think this is uh, yeah, verse 22, shed no blood, cast him in this pit which in the wilderness, do not lay hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Okay, Reuben's the firstborn. Do you know who else is the firstborn according to the scripture? Jesus. The New Testament tells us he's the firstborn of many brethren. Can I tell you what Jesus came to earth to do? To deliver you and bring you back to the father. Exactly what Reuben did. See, that. by the way, that's the purpose of the pit is to de deliver you out of what keeps getting you into pits and then bring you back into relationship with the Father. Okay, Joseph is also a type of Christ in this story. Uh, they took Joseph's robe off of him. They took Jesus's robe off of him. Joseph was um, sold for 20 pieces of silver to Midianite traders, traders. They took him to Egypt and sold him most would believe at a prophet, and the price, we don't know if this from the Bible, we know this from history, the price of an Egyptian slave at that time was 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Judah is the one that said, had the idea to betray him and sell him into slavery. Judas, did, and, and you might not even know this, Judas is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Judah. We have a lot of names in the New Testament that, for instance, even uh, we, we call, uh, we, but never mind, I'll, I'll, I'll get off on all sorts of stuff. I could give you several names. For, let me just give you one. The mother of Jesus' his name was not Mary. That's the Greek word for Miriam. Her Hebrew name was Miriam. And, 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 and as Josh brought up, Jesus' name was, I thought more of you would get that. <clears throat> I'm very, maybe you just didn't want to expect me to have you. Yeshua, see, Jesus would be his Greek name, okay? All right, so all these things are in, by the way, the Midianite traders were carrying uh, balm and spices and myrrh. And when they came to embody the body, uh, embalm the body of Jesus, they were carrying balm, spices, and myrrh. There's just a lot of similarities here. But here's what I want to get through to you. If you're in a pit, I know for a fact that God will not leave you in the pit. And do you know how I know that? Because he didn't leave his own son in the pit. Psalm 1610 says, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, which is the word for the pit. And that's talking about Jesus. Listen, Jesus went to the pit to deliver you out of every pit 
that you get thrown into or that you even dig for yourself and fall into. He came to deliver you out of every pit and to restore you to relationship with the Father. Well, you ever been pushed in a pit? Even by your friends or your brothers, your family? Joseph had. Or have you ever dug a pit for yourself? <laughs> I have. And yet, here's the great thing. The pit has a purpose. And the purpose is to call out to God. So whatever pit you're in right now, whether someone else pushed you in, even someone that you love, or you dug the pit yourself, the reason you heard the message is so that you could call out to God today from the pit. And the reason is because he has a dream for your life and he has a destiny for you to fulfill. Hey, I love you so much. Join us next time as I continue this series, Dream to Destiny. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Robert and thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Be sure to share what God is teaching you in the comments below so that it might encourage others and click the subscribe button and then tap the bell icon so that you'll be notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget, you can watch full episodes anytime right here on my YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching.